True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. When Palo Alto music teacher Christine Fitzhugh was found in a pool of coagulated blood at the bottom of her basement stairs, her husband Ken blamed her shoes. He had warned her over and over, he said, that those shoes were dangerous. She must have stumbled and fallen. But it didn't take long for investigators to question Ken Fitzhugh's theory. The position of her body and her injuries were not consistent with a fall. The blood evidence made Ken the primary suspect in her suspicious death. Blood found in the Fitzhugh's kitchen suggested that she had been attacked there. Further inquiries exposed financial problems and even an extramarital affair resulting in a pregnancy. Join us at the quiet end for No Accident, the Death of Christine Fitzhugh. Ken Fitzhugh denied any involvement in his wife's death but inconsistencies in his story and forensic examination results led to his arrest and a dramatic, highly publicized trial. So I was looking for a beer. Amazingly, Palo Alto doesn't have breweries. They, they do have like a brew pub, a Gordon Biersch Brewing, which is a chain. So I guess that counts kind of. But anyway, they don't actually brew the, the beer there? Is that what you're saying? I'm not sure if they do. Some of their places they do brew at the facility, and others they truck it in. Okie doke. So I picked a, a Meritzen or an Oktoberfest, because it's that time of year. This one's called Cliffhanger Meritzen. And like I said, it is an Oktoberfest. Now, this one, unfortunately, wasn't a very good one. It's a nice amber color, a very thick off-white head, pretty beer. But aroma and taste, not much there. Maybe a hint of caramel. It felt pretty thin when, when you're drinking it. Okay. Not a lot of stuff going on. So overall, I'd have to say this was a disappointing beer. Hmm. Too bad. I hate when beers do that, when they disappoint you. Fortunately, not too many of them have ever disappointed me. (laughs) Well, you know, if you drink enough of them, maybe the disappointment will fade away. It already has. Oh, good. All right. Well, open up a bottle for me. I know you're already into it, but I'd like a bottle. not too bad looking. No, I told you it's not a bad looking beer. (laughs) Okay, well, why don't you bring that on down here to the very, very quiet end of our spare bedroom, now recording studio. All right, let's go. Sit down. Uh, There's a few people here. No, wait, that's not a person. That's a dog. Well, there is a puppy here, but if we locked him out of the studio, he would cry. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Quite loudly. So I'd rather just have a few little noises here and there than a screaming puppy. Very uh, attached to his people right now. Yes, he is. Can't walk too far without him hanging around us. No, but he's adorable. He gets so excited when you get home and he pees all over the floor. You know, he can't help it. He's tiny. But it is cute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Why don't you go ahead and start today's story? Well, and this is a story, I tell you. So Kenneth Fitzhugh Jr. was born in 1943. He grew up in a comfortable suburban home as the only child of Pauline and Ken Sr. Sr. had met Pauline at a local drugstore back in 1941 when he used to eat lunch there. And there's a fairly significant age difference. He's 44 and she was 23 when they met. Now the Fitzhugh family was a very wealthy family. Ken's aunts and uncles were already in their 50s or older when he was born. Money inherited by Ken was the foundation of the wealth he and Christine shared. When Ken Sr.'s sisters died, he and Pauline inherited about $1.5 million. Then in 1982, Ken Sr. died, leaving Ken a trust. And in 1997, Pauline died, and she left Ken all of their assets. So in addition to their wealth, Christine had also inherited nearly a half million dollars from her own family. So it looks like they're doing pretty well. It's 80s and 90s. Good money. Well, yeah, anybody inheriting that kind of money is extremely lucky. 
Yeah, now, as a kid, as a youngster, Ken was small and intelligent. He was remembered by his peers as being a shy and passive kid. His closest friends were girls. He had no interest in sports, but he did like to ride his bike and play board games. I wonder if he was picked on. He might have been. So his mom, Pauline, was a happy, positive person, and she was a devoted teacher who was home for Ken when he got home from school each day. And Ken was given practically everything he wanted. For example, when Ken showed an interest in electric trains, a whole room was added to the house just for his trains. Pauline's value of education was shared by Ken. So he was so well prepared when he began school that he skipped the first grade altogether. He did have some difficulty making friends, but the friends he did make seemed loyal to him. He was never known to lose his temper, but he could be seen as kind of calculating, even sneaky. It seemed like he felt intellectually superior to most of his peers, and as he got older, he developed a rigid personality as a real stickler for rules. As an adult, Ken was okay with forgiving other people's flaws and missteps, but he seemed to take pleasure in believing himself to be the better person. This is a lot to live up to. So according to everyone who knew Ken, he had an absolute horror of being late to anything. And this adherence to schedules and appointments was one way for him to always be right, I guess. So by the time Ken entered high school, he did have a very strong interest in music. His mother and father encouraged him, but they always told him to prepare for a more practical career. That's probably good advice. It probably is, although it seems like a bit of a downer. But not everyone is going to be successful in music, even if you have some talent. You got that right. So Ken entered the California Polytechnic College in 1960, and he majored in electrical engineering. As an undergrad, he was president of the student band. In the summer of 1964, after graduating college, he met Christine Peterson. Christine was only 16 in 1964. She was the daughter of immigrants from Denmark, Einer and Helga Peterson. Einer was a developer who built custom homes in the San Diego community of La Jolla, and he was a perfectionist. This was a trait that he tried to pass on to his daughter, Christine. So when Christine was born in 1947, Einar was kind of on the old side. He was 47 years old. And Helga, Christine's mom, was 42. But Christine did have a gift for music from a young age. And her parents had hopes for her to become a concert pianist. Pushed hard to succeed, Christine suffered anxiety and actually went through a crisis of confidence in these musical abilities she had. In her diary, she once wrote that she set her standards so high, she was always bound to fall short. And she also expressed a need to stop her obsessions with being perfect. And I think this will explain why she married so young to someone like Ken. Start to see a clear picture of who she was and why that happened. Well, they sound like their personalities are pretty similar. Hard-driven perfectionists. Yeah, but I think she also needed someone who was a stickler like Ken. It was kind of a way to escape from her own father. Yeah. So in the fall of 1964, Ken was accepted into a master's degree program in business administration at Stanford. Christine had also skipped a grade. She enrolled at California Lutheran University, intending to study music. So Ken completed his MBA and took a job at an aerospace firm in San Diego. And then in June of 1966, he and Christine were married. Ken was 24, Christine was 18. So... Marrying Ken, as you said, Jill, that was a way for Christine to escape her father and the expectations he held for her and put on her. Christine agreed to commit to complete her education, but she did let go of the goal to becoming concert pianist. Yeah, I think this was a relief to her, and she was able to set her sights on becoming a teacher, which she really loved. Yeah, it sounded like she was having a lot of anxiety about this uh, music career. Sure, so. yeah. Eliminate that. Well, also, teachers are held in pretty high esteem in Denmark, where they seem to have their priorities straight. So her parents were happy with this plan. Oh, absolutely. So they got married, and then uh, Ken and Christine moved to a small apartment just east of San Diego. Christine took classes at San Diego State, and Ken was working as an accountant. Well, it was while he was at this job that Ken met and became friends with Robert Brown. 
Brown was born in 1945, and he had grown up in Compton, California. He graduated from Brigham Young University in Utah and became a CPA, so he was a bright guy too. In 1966, Brown moved to San Diego to go to law school, and he ended up taking a job at the same company as Ken in 1968. Now, this was at the height of the Vietnam War, but both Brown and Ken qualified for draft exemptions because of their jobs. It was considered defense work because the company did manufacturing work for the Air Force. I find that interesting because they did nothing in, in the defense field. Well, I guess the company. The company did. But, yeah. But uh, Ken was an accountant for the company. And, right, exactly. And Brown did some sort of legal stuff. I mean, nothing at all related to a uh, defense contract. But Well, I mean, I have a lot of skepticism about that anyway, but I think we'll let that go. It's not really part of the story. Right. Christine was still going to school, and one day Ken invited Robert Brown to their apartment for dinner. It was a pretty memorable evening because Christine had bought some Chinese takeout and tried to pass it off as her home cooking. <laughs> now, who really does that? I thought that was just a thing you saw in the movies, like uh, Mrs. Doubtfire, remember, did that. So that's kind of funny that someone really did that. Yeah, and it's probably something that wasn't going to get unnoticed. <laughs> well, no, but it also makes me think a little bit about her perfectionist personality. Like, she couldn't just say, I don't want to cook, I'm ordering Chinese. She had to feel like she needed to look like she'd cooked it. That's a little bit sad that she felt that way. A little bit. But anyway, the three of them became really good friends after that, and actually began having dinner together two or three times a week. Then they began doing things together on the weekends as well. Ken and Christine had been quiet, stay-at-home types before they started hanging out with Robert Brown. He got them involved in social activities, including going to nightclubs, riding dune buggies, and camping out. But then, in 1975, Christine and Robert Brown began an affair. Brown believed that Ken wasn't attentive to his wife, and he believed that she was probably starving for affection. Christine even got a post office box so she could exchange letters with Brown. Being Christine and really worrying about what people think of her, she was terrified of the affair being found out. But she did meet with Brown about once a week at his apartment, and they also talked on the phone several times a week, so it was pretty hot and heavy for a while. Yeah, the dynamics interest me, I mean, because they did everything together as a threesome. Well, not everything. Well, okay, not everything. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. Brown did continue to have dinner with Christine and Ken and spend weekends with them. They were so close, in fact, that they had nicknames for one another. Brown called Ken Weasel, you know, because he said he kind of looked like a weasel and also because he saw him as secretive and tricky, especially when it came to money. Ken had made Christine sign a power of attorney, which gave him control of all of their assets. And Brown, a lawyer, had drafted the document for him. But he wasn't really on board with it. He didn't think that was a great thing to do. But they did it. Now, Brown's nickname is Aardvark because he called himself Dr. Aardvark once when they reserved a table at a restaurant. And nobody was able to explain how Christine had become Snake. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of a terrible uh, <laughs> nickname. It doesn't have a good connotation, does it? No, but I think the Aardvark is pretty funny. Somebody had a reservation, and he was trying to take it over by saying, I'm the doctor, I'm Dr. Aardvark, and they all had a good laugh about that. So Brown, Ken, and Christine just became more and more involved over the next several years. They had joint real estate projects, boats, motorhome, and dune buggies. Brown taught Ken and Christine how to sail, and they entered one of their boats in the Newport to Ensenada International Yacht Race. They drank together on the weekends, Ken and Christine in moderation, Brown to excess. Well, yeah, Brown was a character, but he also had a lot of issues. He liked to use drugs, and he was known for having a high tolerance to both drugs and alcohol, but ended up getting himself in quite a bit of trouble in his life. But he was a good time for Ken and Christine, who were just so reserved. But then as time passed, there were several people who began to suspect that Christine and Brown were having an affair. Ken would deny ever knowing about the affair, but he did seem to target Brown in some unusual accidents over the years. 
Like once, Ken drove his car over Brown's foot, and Brown suffered some broken bones, but Ken convinced him to put off going to the hospital. And as a result of this, Brown got a systemic infection and had to be on antibiotics for months. Then another time, Ken made a sharp turn on their sailboat and knocked Brown unconscious, which seemed kind of purposeful. <laughs> so maybe he did have some underlying resentment and anger against Robert Brown. Yeah, but not on the surface. Everything's hunky-dory. They're having yeah. fun together. And as far as Brown knew, he was oblivious to the affair. Right. So after she graduated from San Diego State, Christine got her teaching credentials and took a job as an elementary school teacher. Ken left his job and began a career in real estate development. They bought a house and hosted a housewarming party. Al Brown was there, and everybody who saw him said that he seemed to be in a very good mood. Then at one point in the evening, Christine and Brown went out to get some ice. They didn't come back for several hours. But this didn't seem to concern Ken at all. Well, yeah, later on, Ken would say that he thought Robert Brown was gay, because I guess Robert Brown was bisexual. And Ken would say that Brown actually made a pass at him. Although, looking back, Brown would say that it was actually Ken who made a pass at him. So we don't know, but it was clear to everybody else around them that Christine and Brown were pretty tight. So there would be many versions of what exactly was going on when Christine became pregnant with her first son in 1977. And Brown would give four versions. Ken would maintain that he had no idea that Brown was the biological father of Justin, their oldest son. But in one version, Brown claimed that Christine had told him she wanted to become pregnant and she had stopped using birth control. And then in other versions, he said he found out that he was Justin's father at various times in his life. So he didn't really give a straight story, but he wasn't always the best with the memory because of such intense drug and alcohol use over several years. Yeah, I can imagine. So Christine's intention to get pregnant and why she did it would become the topic of discussion when Ken's motive for murder was examined. According to Brown, Christine had gotten pregnant in order to qualify for inheritances from Ken's aunts. The aunts were worth millions, but the inheritances would not happen if Ken and Christine did not have an heir. Yeah, and that's just kind of a rumor. We don't know that to be true. There was nothing in writing about that. But Christine did say that Ken and Christine tried to get pregnant for a long time. They even did see a fertility expert. But after 10 years of being married, they were still childless. So in 1977, Robert Brown took a job as an attorney for a fast food chain. And this required that he move to Fresno. He gave Christine power of attorney over his San Diego house and bought a new house in Fresno. And he and Christine continued to talk quite often. When Justin was born in March of 1978, Brown flew in to be there. So that's interesting. It certainly is. I'm assuming that Ken was there also, right? I think so, yeah. <laughs> so for the first three years of Justin's life, Brown would visit him frequently. As he got older, Brown began to notice that he looked like him. According to Brown and his Aunt Janet Moore, Christine took Justin to a Brown family get-together in 1979 and told Brown's grandmother that Justin was her great-grandson. Brown also said that Christine brought Justin to visit him in Fresno. Then in 1981, Brown gave Christine a diamond, diamond ring that she wore with her wedding band from Ken. So that, to me, is so strange. It really is. I mean, I really had to stop when I was reading about that, because why would that be okay with Ken? It'd be kind of weird, right? It strikes me as weird. Yeah. She's wearing it right there with her wedding band, and it's like she's married to the two of them almost. But Ken would deny knowing anything about it, so it's really hard to say. Yeah, well, I would just wonder what the relationship exactly was between Ken and Brown. Yeah, you think maybe they were lovers? That would be a possibility to me anyway. Yeah, maybe yeah. at some point. Because all three of them doing all this stuff together? Yeah, it's and, a little unusual. And I would bet you that Ken was aware of his wife's affair with Brown. Well, a lot of people think that, but Ken would deny that. Well, sure. Christine and Ken relocated to Palo Alto in 1981, buying their house on Escobita Avenue. 
Their son John was born that year, and they proceeded to fill and decorate the house with these valuable antiques from Ken's aunts. His Aunt Ruth died in 1976 and left all of her furniture, paintings, and carpets to Ken. By 1987, Ken and Christine had inherited just under $1 million. And that's when Ken left his job and went into business for himself. And there'll be different viewpoints from different people, but it seems that Ken then proceeded to lose a lot of money. This was as a real estate developer, right? Exactly, yes. Yeah, well, I mean, that can be a speculative profession. Sure, and that's the kind of economy that has really had some problems during recessions right. and I mean, things. You can you can do quite well and you can lose your shirt. Absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of a gamble. So throughout the 80s, Brown continued to get together with Ken and Christine, and the children, Justin and John, went on trips with the three of them. So Brown was accepted by the children as a family member, and actually Brown and Christine went on some skiing trips together without Ken to Colorado and Lake Tahoe. So you're right, I mean, if Ken didn't know they were sleeping together, he was an idiot. He was oblivious, which I just can't see. He wasn't a stupid guy. No, I'm just thinking that Ken and Brown were having some physical closeness also. Physical closeness, that's a nice way to put it. Well, sure, I suppose, but, you know, he would just continue to deny it. Yeah, I know. But I think the trips and the ring would certainly make my ears perk up. Uh Uh-huh. But, you know, at the same time, Brown's drug and alcohol problem was really getting the best of him. He had recurrent hepatitis, and his judgment was really suffering. He ended up getting involved with a law client who paid him in stolen goods, and he was arrested. He ended up being charged with receiving stolen property. And then the California bar began proceedings to suspend his law license. In the 1990s, Brown got into trouble again for taking legal fees for services not performed. And these complaints persisted, and Brown was finally disbarred in 1997. So by 1994, Brown's alcohol abuse was just totally out of control. He had lost his house in Fresno. Ken and Christine intervened and paid $12,000 for him to go to rehab. He promised he would stay clean of drugs and alcohol. But then a, a year later, in 1995, Brown relapsed. And at that point, Ken told him he wasn't welcome in their house anymore. According to Brown, he was taking drugs and making a fool of himself and was told by Ken and Christine that they didn't want to watch him kill himself. Yeah, so in 97, Brown moved to Placerville. And he said that he sent postcards to the Fitzhughes in 1997 and 1999, giving them his new address and phone number. Then he claimed that Christine had called him in January of 2000 to tell him that he was invited to Justin's graduation, and also that she was planning to tell Justin that Brown is his biological father. So that's a big deal. It is. Where do you want to bet he already knew that? He just had to, right? I would think. I think so. How could you not? I mean, if you look at pictures, the kid does look just like him. He's much bigger and bulkier. Doesn't look anything like Ken. And the other boy looked a lot like Ken. Much more slightly built boy. So, it just seems obvious. Yeah, you can't argue genetics. Right, exactly. Got these two kids, well, each look like his biologic father. Yeah, I mean, denial can be a strong thing as well, so you have to consider that, but I think with the ring and the trips and everything else, you kind of had to know. You kind of did. Yeah. So, on May 5th, 2000, Ken was helping two family friends, Galen Mason and Carol Perino, to plan a party. This was a birthday celebration for Galen, and there were big plans here. It's going to be a teacher's night out with a casino theme. So they had a roulette wheel and a craps table to pick up from a party rental store. So Galen was a fifth grade teacher, and her roommate Carol was an elementary school principal. They waited in the apartment for Ken Fitzhugh to arrive in his suburban. He showed up along with his two dogs, a standard poodle, and a Pomeranian. Now, the plan was that he would drive them to San Jose to pick up the stuff at the party rental store for the Saturday night party because he's got this big suburban. They can load it up with all that stuff. Sure. So Ken arrived at Galen and Carol's apartment right on time, of course, at 1.30 p.m. He wore black jeans, a plaid shirt, and white socks with brown leather shoes. 
Now remember that. That's kind of going to be an important thing here. Okay, I'll remember. <laughs> so Galen got into the passenger seat and Carol got into the second seat behind her. Everything seemed normal to them as Ken started up his blue Suburban, and as he pulled away from the curb, he asked the two women if they minded stopping by his house first to check on Christine. He told them he'd just gotten a call from the school district and Christine had missed her 12.50 p.m. class, something that had never happened before. So Galen and Carol are friends of Christine as well as Ken, so they agreed, and they tried to recall Christine's schedule, but it was always changing. Carol wondered aloud if Christine had gotten confused and maybe just gone to the wrong school that day. But, you know, that wouldn't have been at all like Christine. She was known for being very, very organized. Yeah, so they pulled up in front of the house on Escobita, not even bothering to park. Ken shut off the engine and headed for the front door, which was partially open. As Carol and Galen watched from the Suburban, Ken went into the house. They left the door wide open. He could be seen running upstairs to the second floor, and then the women saw him come back down the stairs and turn right. Then seconds after that, he ran out the front door, yelling something to them. Well, yeah, he was calling them to come and help him. And for a brief moment, the women wondered if he was playing some kind of joke or if this was some kind of surprise party for Galen. But they could quickly see that he was serious. So the two women got out of Ken's vehicle and ran toward the house. As they entered the front door, Ken was already inside, and he ran down to the basement. They looked down and they saw him standing over Christine at the bottom of the stairs. Christine was face down in a pool of blood, so this is quite shocking, of course. Well, yeah, I mean, it looks like she's dead, right? Yeah, definitely and, bleeding heavily at the bottom of the stairs. Right. And as far as we know, when Ken left the house... She was alive, or she was off to work. or She or was off to do another class, right? There, there was nothing beforehand that would make you worried. Well, I think he was always worried about the shoes, Dick. It's the shoes. So he said, Ken's going kind of nuts, of course. Oh, my God, there's blood everywhere. He called out to the ladies, Carol and Galen, that uh, I can't get a pulse. And he told them to call 911. Now, that's interesting, too, because there was a phone in the basement he could have used. But across the hallway in the kitchen, Carol grabbed the cordless phone and called for help. This was at 1.40 p.m., so just 10 minutes after he'd picked these two women up. Carol gave the 911 operator the address and said that someone had fallen and was badly hurt. After being told that help is on the way, she hung up the phone and returned to the basement landing. She and Galen looked down the steps and saw Ken... He was still just standing there near Christine's head, so he looked like he hadn't moved or done anything to try and rescue her up to this point. So another kind of weird thing. A little bit weird, huh? But again, he told the women to call 911, and he asked if they knew CPR. So they told him they already had called 911, help was on the way, and they had learned CPR as part of their teacher training, but neither of them had ever actually performed it. Galen hesitated, but then ran down the stairs to help. And she and Ken turned Christine over so that she was face up. Ken pulled her so that her feet were off of the steps. He told Galen that Christine was not breathing and she might be dead, but they had to try anyway. So to me, that's accepting it too soon for me. This early on, he should be trying to save her and not thinking she might be dead. Right. Well, just the fact that the... Women look down the stairs, and there's Ken just standing next to her and not doing anything. Yeah, right. And Christine was not a big woman. He certainly could have turned her over himself and started doing something. But he told Galen to start chest compressions as he started giving rescue breaths. And there was a gurgling noise coming from her throat, and blood was oozing out of the back of her head. So she was very badly injured. And this pool of blood was just expanding as they performed compressions because they're pushing the blood out into the body and yeah. she's bleeding more. So that's just not going to help, clearly. But between giving breaths, Ken looked at Galen and said, Those shoes, those goddamn shoes. I told her to throw them away a thousand times. And he seemed really angry about the shoes. He actually nodded at the upper steps where Galen saw a black sandal lying on its side. And Ken said something about the shoe and that Christine must have fallen 
while taking the dry cleaning down to the basement. Because Christine was lying on a plastic dry cleaning bag, Ken said she must have knocked herself out and then suffocated on the plastic. So those are very weird what? suppositions. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Odd, odd, odd. Yeah, I don't see how you can just sort of assume she's on this plastic bag and she suffocated. Well, why are you even thinking that far ahead? You should be concentrating on the trouble at hand, I would think. Yeah. Here she is bleeding like crazy anyway. Well, right. And then when you give the compressions, the bleeding's getting worse. So that's a really bad sign. So they were continuing CPR as they heard sirens approaching. Christine did not respond at all. When the firemen arrived, Carol showed them to the basement, and they ran down with a resuscitation and emergency equipment. They told Ken and Galen to stop, and they took over the resuscitation. Now that's when they also noticed a large brass ship's bell on the lower landing near the dry cleaning. It was in a place where Carol could have struck her head when she slipped and fell. So one of the firemen pushed the bell and the dry cleaning out of the way. Now Galen stood back as the firemen intubated Christine. It was just too crowded for her to walk back up the stairs, but she saw Ken stepping around Christine's body and climb the stairs, and he was holding his hands up at a 90-degree angle as they dripped blood onto his forearms. And there was also a large amount of blood on his face. So is this from the resuscitation? He's performing the breaths. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this woman was very, very badly injured, and we'll get into that, of course, with the autopsy. Galen left the basement by the storm doors at the rear of the basement, and this led her out to the Fitzhugh's backyard. Then at 1.47 p.m., Palo Alto police officer Sastra Priest arrived at the Fitzhugh house. The first person he interacted with was Carol Pereno, who was still holding Fitzhugh's cordless phone. He asked her where the victim was, and she nodded toward the basement. Priest went to the top of the stairs and walked partway down, He saw two firemen leaning over Christine and a large pool of blood beneath her head. He turned back and asked Carol what had happened, and Carol explained that they just found her lying at the bottom of the stairs. She added that the front door had been open and that Ken, the victim's husband, had found her. As Priest listened to Carol, he saw Ken coming up from the basement with the bloody hands that were raised up like he's a surgeon or something. He's just scrubbed in. Yes. But Ken didn't say anything. He just turned right and walked down the hallway. And Priest watched him disappear into a room at the end of the hall. And he probably shouldn't have just stood there at that point. He probably should have stopped Ken. But he didn't. Then a pair of paramedics walked by, headed toward the basement stairs with a stretcher. Another officer then entered the house. Officer Tom Pohl arrived at 1.49 p.m. And Priest told him that the victim was in the basement. Pole went toward the basement landing, and Priest continued talking to Carol. He saw Ken come out of the bathroom and walk toward him. Of course, at this point, he didn't know that it was a bathroom. But Pole was leaving the basement as Ken began to go back down, and Pole stopped him. Then Pole and Ken walked toward Priest and Carol. So Priest walked down the hall and looked into the rooms, and he saw that Ken had been in a bathroom. He'd gone in there to wash the blood off of his face and hands, But the officers were already suspicious that this was not an accident. There was just so much blood, too much for a simple fall down the stairs. Jill, what are you burning out here? Bodies? (laughs) Well, no. I'm throwing in all of our earbuds and headphones with a little bit of lighter fluid as my protest against podcast ads in my favorite shows. I'm just getting into a story or I'm dozing off and it's interrupted with commercials. I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore. (laughs) Nice movie reference. Anyway, let's just simmer down here. You do know that our True Crime Brewery listeners have the option to subscribe to our premium show for ad-free episodes and bonus episodes, right? It costs as little as $4 per month and these contributions help support the cost of producing TCB. Well, of course. I love and appreciate our subscribers. You know, I worked for weeks with our IT girl to set that up, and all because I have a deeply held belief that our listeners shouldn't have to hear ads. That's well said. Now, let me ask you this. 
How are we going to record this week's episode without our headphones? Oh, for fuck's sake. Well, you stay here. I'll go get the hose. Okay, hurry. Just after 2 p.m., homicide detective Mike Denson was paged. Now, he was the only homicide detective in Palo Alto, and he was needed at the Fitzhugh house. Over his time as a police officer, Denson had taken some specialized training in traffic accident investigation, drug enforcement, and then in the late 1990s, homicide investigation. In 1997, he became Palo Alto's primary homicide detective, and since then, he'd only had three murders to investigate, so about one a year. About one a year, right. But despite the rarity of murders in Palo Alto, Denson really was a skilled investigator who worked his cases methodically and thoroughly. I would almost think without having as much experience, he had to concentrate more on doing it correctly. It's not something that he does every day. That's true. But Denson went to the Fitzhugh house at 2.45 p.m., and he entered the house through those rear storm doors leading straight into the basement. Christine's body had been left there on the concrete floor in a pool of coagulating blood, and near her there was the dry cleaning, some scattered school papers, and a large gray bell. Then up on the step they did see a right black sandal lying on its side, one of the shoes that Ken was cursing. And so her injuries were too severe, at least the police felt, to have been caused by a fall down the stairs, even if she had hit her head on the bell. Then the position of the right shoe is odd, too. If Christine had indeed slipped in her shoes, the right shoe would have been on the right side of the stairs, right? Yeah, but it was on the left. But it was on the left. And I'm still not sure how, I mean, you've got these sandals on. How does one come flying off your foot? Well, I think they only had a strap over the toe area, and they were open in the back. So that's certainly possible, but I just feel like if you stumbled in those shoes, the first thing you do is drop the dry cleaning and brace yourself with your hands. So that was one thing about her position that was very strange. Then the papers on the floor didn't make much sense either. Like, was she planning to go to the basement to grade papers or what? Yeah, this wasn't the kind of basement where you would do that. She had her things laid out on the kitchen table as well. Yeah, so if she had been murdered... It would seem possible that it happened there. But there wasn't any notable blood spatter on the walls or floor, just a large puddle beneath her head that was spreading around her body. So if she had been attacked and hit with a blunt object, there should have been evidence of cast-off blood on the wall's floor or even the ceiling. But there wasn't. Yeah, and they saw no sign of blood upstairs either, at least not at this point. Denson was told that a bloody sneaker print was seen on the basement floor, and he did see a similar shoe print on the door of the closed wardrobe at the bottom of the stairs. So the police had a lot of questions. Carol, Galen, and Ken were sitting in the dining room, and they were all quiet. Galen was in shock. The picture of Christine lying on the basement floor was just stuck in her mind. It just didn't seem real, as I could imagine. Christine had really been a good friend of hers, and these images from that day would haunt her for years and years to come. Galen remembered being in the basement with Ken and how he pointed to the lone shoe on the step and said something about how Christine must have fallen. He had said that CPR was probably useless and that Christine was probably already dead. She looked at Ken's hands and saw dried blood in the cracks of his skin and around his nails. So he'd washed his hands, but not super thoroughly. Yeah, well, I mean, he just wanted to get the huge amount of blood off as well as he could. I think that's reasonable, sure. Yeah. So Ken was asking about his sons. You know, how how should they be told? They are both away at college at that time. He said he didn't want them to be alone when they were told of their mother's death. So he went into the kitchen and got a list of phone numbers and his cell phone. So he called his oldest son, Justin, first and told him the bad news. Despite him not wanting them to be alone, that's what happened, right? Yeah. Well, I guess he'd said to him, you know, are you sitting down? Is someone with you? And Justin was just like, for God's sake, just tell me. I mean, at this point, he knew it was something bad. 
They were able to contact Justin's fiance, who agreed to pick him up at school and drive him home, so at least he wouldn't have to drive home alone with that knowledge in his mind. And then Ken called their younger son, John, who was off at college in Washington State, so they had to make arrangements for him to fly home. Carol remembered that the dogs had been left in the Suburban, and the police agreed to go out with Ken and allow him to move the dogs from the car to the backyard but a police officer did accompany him to the car and back to the house. So that was good police procedure. They weren't letting him out of their sight. Ken told Galen and Carol that they'd have to find someone else to help them transport the party things. <laughs> I Duh. <guess> so. <laughs> I mean, what the hell? Jesus. Carol said, don't worry. Of course, we're not having the party now. And then Ken said a really strange thing, I think. He said, I'm sorry I got you involved in this. Yeah, that is weird. A I little mean, bit weird, yeah. It- The only involvement is that they were present with him. I know. It's almost like he's saying, I'm sorry I got you involved in, you know, helping me cover up this murder. Yeah. So Denson went into the dining room around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Ken, Carol, Galen, and the two dogs were sitting in there. The investigators at the house weren't sure what had happened, but they were feeling fairly certain that Christine had not died from a simple fall down the stairs. They were obviously anxious to hear what the coroner would have to say, and they decided to treat the scene very carefully. So they minimized the movements of everyone and kept Carol, Galen, and Ken together in the dining room, and each of them would be interviewed separately. Yeah, first Denson asked Galen to speak with him privately, and they went into the family room down the hall. Once there, Galen confirmed that Carol had not gone all the way down the basement steps and she told him what she remembered from the time Ken picked her up at her apartment to the time at the house when the first responders arrived. After he had talked to Galen, Denson decided to get everyone out of the house and separate them to get their individual versions of what had happened. Ken, Galen, and Carol were asked to come to the police station to be interviewed, but Ken didn't want to go. He was concerned that Justin and his fiancée might show up. Denson explained to him that the coroner would soon be there, and they'd be removing Kristen's body in a body bag, and he told Ken, you don't want to see that. And of course, if your son shows up, we will send him on to the police station. So eventually, Ken did agree to go to the police station. Before they left, an officer asked Ken if he could move his Suburban. It was still sitting at an angle on the wrong side of the street where Ken had left it when he ran in. So he didn't want to let the policeman do it. He said he would take care of it so he went out and reparked his vehicle himself. He then got into a police car with an officer, and Carol and Galen rode in another car with Detective Denson. They went to the Palo Alto PD, and that was only a few minutes away. Once at the station, Denson put Carol, Galen, and Ken into separate interview rooms. The police, of course, wanted to get their versions of that day as soon as they could, and they didn't want them sharing their memories or interpretations with one another. So two detectives were assigned to speak with the two women, while Denson himself went to interview Ken. So both Carol and Galen said that Ken told them he got a call from the Palo Alto School District asking about Christine. He told them that he had tried calling Christine, but he'd gotten no answer. Now both women had known the Fitzhughes for several years. They had met them through the school district in the early 90s when all three women had taught classes at the Cesar Chavez Academy in East Palo Alto. Over the years, they had become close, and they often went out to dinner together or even on vacations together. Yeah, Ken and Christine were a little bit older, and they were kind of like mentors to Galen and Carol. They had moved to Palo Alto from San Diego in the early 1980s. Christine had teaching credentials, and she worked as a part-time music and singing teacher in the various elementary schools. Both Christine and Ken were gifted pianists, the couple had formed the Palo Alto Ravenswood Collaborative Music Project, which helped disadvantaged students get instruments and learn to play them. So that's a really nice thing. Very nice. But it was Christine in the family who made the friends and organized things. She was the more outgoing one, and many people described her as a real perfectionist. Ken was quiet, but he did seem supportive of his wife. Carol and Galen both denied seeing any problems between Ken and Christine. The couple clearly loved one another, they said, and they didn't know of any financial problems either. 
the Fitzhughes seemed quite wealthy. Now, it was 4.30 in the afternoon when Denson sat down to talk with Ken Fitzhugh. Ken was 57 years old, long gray hair, and large wireframe glasses. He was slouching in his chair, and his hands were clasped together across his lap. People who were there that day said that Ken seemed very detached and not really attentive to things. Yeah, I mean, this is something we come across with every case we cover is the behavior. Yeah, how are you supposed to behave, right? Right. So I really can't make too many judgments from that, but it's important to say it because I think the police were really judging him from that. Yeah, well, like you've said also, they're already thinking that this isn't a simple fall down the stairs. Right, and who's going to break in and do that? So, of course, they're looking at him. Denson didn't know exactly what had happened to Christine, but he was aware that something was wrong. He felt that even if she had fallen down the stairs, her injuries were far worse than was explainable by the fall. The first responders had said that they didn't think she had fallen to her death. Only the autopsy would reveal her wounds in detail. Yeah, Denson told Ken that an investigation would be done so he needed to hear every detail of what had happened before the firemen arrived at the house. And then he also asked Ken if he would consent to a search of the house. But before Ken could answer that question, his son John called him on his cell, and it was obvious that John was upset, and Ken was urging him to try and compose himself. Then he said that he, Justin, and Justin's fiance would pick up John at the airport that night. Once he was off the phone, Ken did agree to the search, and he said, they can tear the place apart. So it's like he's got nothing to hide. Do do what you need to do to solve this murder. Yes, but he's not going to stick with that attitude for long. (laughs) So while Ken was with Denson, the police were searching. Investigator Gary Brooks was at the house, and he found the car keys. So he walked outside and clicked the unlock button uh, and looked inside. Now, the Suburban was outside of the crime scene tape. When Brooks opened the driver's side door, he saw a pair of white sneakers peeking out from under the driver's seat. Brooks had seen these shoes on Ken when he went out to repark the vehicle. That's what he believed, yeah. So interesting. Yeah, they obviously weren't on him now because they're under his car seat. No, and also, Carol and Galen thought that he was already wearing the black loafers, the leather loafers, when he picked them up. So we're not sure if that was accurate. So there's a small mystery here. Yeah, well, the shoes end up being kind of a big deal. Brooks looked closely at the shoes, and he picked them up, which he shouldn't have done, and he saw what looked like blood stains on the shoes. Then he put them back under the seat, knowing, whoops, I shouldn't have touched them. These bloodstains were really small, just about three small smears on the inner front of the right shoe, and there would end up being some blood on the bottom of one of the shoes as well. But Brooks knew that handling the shoes was a problem. The Suburban had been outside of the crime scene tape, so they weren't in plain view. He knew that the blood spots could be very significant in this investigation, so he decided to go to his superior at the station and tell him what he had found. When Ken was given the consent to search form back at the station, he had a change of heart. Now he only agreed to having the basement and the stairs themselves searched. But in the end, it wasn't going to matter because if Ken didn't consent, they knew they could get a search warrant. Well, sure. In addition to the blood on the shoes, it also looked like the tread pattern of the shoe matched the bloody shoe prints that had been seen in the basement. But Denson continued to question Ken, And Ken described everything that had happened that day from the time he woke up in the morning. He said that he and Christine had both been up at 6 a.m. and they'd gone for a run together with their two dogs. Now, how much running is a Pomeranian going to do? I was just thinking that. Those little legs. I mean, sure, the standard poodle. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I don't think it was a very long run, I guess. Unless maybe they had a little backpack for the Pomeranian. Yeah, well, and, and this is just Ken saying that. True. Maybe it didn't even happen. Right. But after that, he said they went home and they both worked on their computers for a while. Ken worked from home anyway. So Ken said that Christine left the house at 10 a.m. to teach her first class. And during that time, he'd been going between his house and his next door neighbor's house because he was helping the lawyer there with computer issues. Then at 11 a.m., he put the dogs in his car and drove to see a real estate project. 
He had trouble remembering, though, where this project was located, which was really weird. Suspicious, not just weird. It is suspicious, isn't it? I mean, how could yeah. you not remember that? I mean, part of your alibi. Right. I don't know. I mean, I guess to give him the benefit of the doubt, he could have been really upset and in shock. But then he said he returned to Palo Alto for his 130 plans with Galen and Carol. As he was driving down the freeway back to Palo Alto, Ken said, he got a call from the school district. Christine had missed her 1250 class. Christine never missed a class. So when he arrived at Carol and Galen's place, he asked them if they had time to stop by his house and check on Christine. Now, what if they said, no, we don't have time? He's going to say, oh, well, we'll check her out in a few hours when we get back. But of course, they agreed. And no, I'm sure he knew that they would agree. They're friends. Sure, but it just seems a little casual to me. Why not stop by the house first before you go pick them up? Well, then he'd be late. Well, right? yeah, you that's know, true. He, He's terrified of that. He can't do that. Anyway, they agreed, of course, and they did stop at the house. Yeah, so when they, when they drove up to the house, Christine's car was in the driveway. And the front door was open. So that was pretty odd. And Ken didn't really park the car, just sort of stopped it and rushed in to see what was going on. So first he went upstairs and went to his right, expecting to find her in the home office. But she wasn't there, and he called out for her. And then he went to the master bedroom, the bathroom, and family room. And as he passed the basement door, he saw the light was on and the door was open. And this wasn't a normal occurrence, so he went to the landing and looked down. And that's when he saw Christine at the bottom of the stairs, face down. Yeah, but to Denson, Ken seemed very calm and flat. And he would say that Ken was unlike any other grieving spouse he had ever seen. So Ken seemed detached. And when he did show emotion, to Denson, it did seem kind of overdone. And if you look at any of the video footage of his interview, he does seem like he's just a bad actor. <laughs> that's not good. No, no. So Ken described going to get Carol and Galen and giving Christine CPR. He described seeing the black shoe on a step, and then he suddenly became very animated. He moved up in his seat and he yelled, The goddamn black shoes! So he shook his fists and slammed them down on the desk. <laughs> and then within seconds, he was calm again, as if this outburst had never happened. But it was just a bit much. It made Denson wonder if it was a similar outburst which led him to brutally murder his wife. And the entire police station heard this outburst. Galen and Carol ran to the small window and looked into the interview room. And Denson just looked at them and shrugged. I don't know, just weirdness. And then Ken just slumped over in his chair again, all detached and quiet. He told Denson that Christine owned this pair of black shoes and that she had fallen in them before and he had asked her repeatedly to throw the damn things away, but she wouldn't. Yeah, Denson had also noticed that Ken was wearing black leather loafers with white athletic socks. It seemed that Ken had switched his white running shoes for the black loafers. Yeah, it would, because you're not going to wear athletic socks with black loafers. Well, some guys do. No, no, no. It's, it's not just, recommended. It's just not done. Oh, I think it's done. And then once Denson heard about the white sneakers that had been found in the Suburban, he was more certain than ever that Ken had killed his wife. Yeah, so do you think he was certain too soon? Are they jumping to conclusions here? Well, if the way this is going, yeah, I think it's too soon. Yeah, I think so too. I think they should wait until they get all the information because it kind of gave them some tunnel vision. Not that I'm defending Ken or think he's innocent necessarily, but they're really jumping to conclusions very quickly here. Yeah, and I'm not sure... They're justified conclusions. And well, they, it's too early to tell, like you said. Right. So Denson wanted to get Ken to commit to a story, and then he would work to poke holes in that story. Yeah, so they're already going after him pretty strongly. But Ken did go on about the shoes. He said that Christine had fallen on a sidewalk, and if he hadn't broken her fall, she would have smashed her face. He said that he told her at least six times to throw those shoes away. But you know what she did? She went out and she bought a pair of red shoes, just like the black ones. So that would piss you off, right? That might make you throw her down the stairs. Yeah, because I told her, get different shoes. Yeah, she wasn't listening. Nope. So Ken said it wasn't just the shoes that bothered him, it was the bell also. 
They'd had the bell in their yard for 18 years, but just a week before, Ken had brought it into the house to see if he could sell it on eBay. He had taken it down to the basement, didn't put it away, and it was pretty heavy, so when he reached the bottom of the stairs, he just put it down. So he's feeling a little guilty for that, he said, because he's going by the story that she fell down the stairs and whacked her head on the bell. Yeah, but I think the police are thinking, even if she hit her head on the bell, this isn't making sense. Right. But Denson's thoughts kept returning to those white sneakers. If Ken had been wearing them when the firemen arrived, that would explain the blood on them. And now Ken's wearing the black shoes with the white socks, which Dick says is not done. No, it just isn't. (laughs) But when had he had a chance to put the bloody shoes in the Suburban? That's the big question. Yeah, I mean, I guess what Denson's supposing is that he had the white sneakers on when he pushed his wife or did whatever to his wife, and then at some point changed them into the black loafers and stuck the sneakers under his driver's seat. Sure, yeah. But let's see how we can get that to hold up. Yeah, I mean, they would talk more to Carol Galen and the first responders to see if anyone remembered what he was wearing when he found Christine and while he was doing the resuscitation attempts. It was possible, of course, that the blood stains had been on the shoe before Christine had been killed. The blood could have nothing to do with her injuries or her death. Ken may have bled on them in the recent past, but still his demeanor was setting off some alarms. At the Fitzhugh house, photos were taken of the single black shoe on the step, and it was a sandal with a heel, but not a high heel. The other shoe was found at the bottom of the steps with the bell, the school papers, and the dry cleaning. Then there was that wardrobe at the base of the stairs, which was partially open, and there was clothing hanging inside. Nearby, they also found a pair of women's eyeglasses with a lens knocked out, and there was some blood spatter on the lens. Then once they were upstairs, investigators noticed a blood stain on the hallway floor and on the basement landing near the hallway. So they moved on to photograph the dining room and the kitchen as well. There really shouldn't be a blood stain on the hallway floor if we're thinking she fell down the stairs, right? Well, I mean, he did walk upstairs with his hands dripping blood to go wash them in the bathroom. I forgot about that. Yeah. Okay. So that's possible. So Denson continued to interview Ken at the station. He wanted to pin him down on his location after he left the house that morning. He said that he had left the house at 11 to view a real estate parcel that was about 45 minutes away. And he left the location at 1245. He gave Denson some details. He said that a man had called to ask him about the parcel. Now, he had done work on the same parcel for the family golf centers, and the man wanted to put a church on the property. So Ken said that he went to the property to see if a church could be built there. Yeah, but another suspicious thing is he couldn't recall the man's name right away. (laughs) Okay. But according to Ken, he had received the call from the school district at about 1.15 while he was driving on the freeway. He said he thought about going to his house before picking up Carol and Galen, but they weren't far away, and he decided to pick them up first. Like you said, he didn't want to be late. Ken said that they left Carol and Galen's apartment building at 1.35, and they arrived at his house at 1.40. But he denied changing any of his clothing. He committed to that story. He said he was wearing black loafers when he found Christine. Ken said nothing about putting the white sneakers under his car seat, which I'm sure made Denson think, well, we've got him. Well, yeah. Who else, anyway, would put them under the car seat? Sure, exactly. But we'll see. So at 6 o'clock that evening... The detectives, Ken, Galen, and Carol, all returned to the Fitzhugh house. Ken agreed to a full search of the house as long as he could be present for the search. Yeah, so Denson had Ken walk him through the house room by room, and they looked for any sign of a break-in or any missing valuables. Nothing was missing, including all of Christine's jewelry. There were no broken windows or any points of entry for a burglar. While Denson went with Ken through the house, two detectives began the official search of the Suburban. A Palo Alto detective opened the Suburban's driver's side door and removed the white sneakers after taking several photos of their location. Another detective opened the back of the Suburban and found a wadded-up, red-stained paper towel. Denson asked Ken about the shoes he was wearing during his morning run, and he said he had been wearing his white sneakers. He said that after the run, he'd put them in his upstairs closet. So he was shown a photo of the shoes in the Suburban, 
and he said he had no idea how the shoes ended up in his vehicle. Yeah, that's really strange. I don't know how that happened. Yeah, so that doesn't look good. No. He said, those shoes look like mine, but I can't be sure. And he was just dumbfounded, he said. He wouldn't say that the shoes were his until they brought them to him in a clear plastic bag, and he said, yep, those are mine. Okay. So Denson then told Ken that the shoes appeared to have blood on them. Ken didn't react to this at all. Then he was told that the red spots would be tested. Still no reaction from Ken. He said he was sure that he had put the shoes in his upstairs closet. Well, Ken took Denson and another detective to his bedroom, and they looked into that closet. All of his shoes were very neatly lined up, and there was a blank space where Ken said the shoes should have been. Still, he insisted that he had left them there that morning after his run. Denson asked for the clothing that Ken had worn during this run, and Ken said that they were in the laundry basket, but when they looked, the laundry basket was empty. So Ken said that Christine must have put the clothes into the washer. There was a wet load of clothing in the washer, so they were able to collect his clothing and check for some blood residue, but they had been washed. They had been washed. Ken was also confronted with a bloody paper towel found in the back of the Suburban. He had no explanation for how that had ended up there. Denson suggested that maybe Ken had used the paper towel when he went into the bathroom to wash his hands, and he took it with him when he went to check on his dogs in the Suburban, and it had been left there. And Ken agreed. He said, yeah, probably that's what happened. Yeah, but Ken's acceptance of this explanation only made Denson more suspicious. The officers who came to the house said that they had constant contact with Ken, or at least constantly had him in their sights. So if they could prove that Ken had not put the bloody towel into the car when he said he did, they could prove that he was lying about that, too. Denson was at the house when Ken and Christine's older son, Justin, arrived. Justin was outside of the crime scene tape, and he was asking to see Ken. Ken went outside to meet him, and Justin was crying and hugged Ken, but still, Ken didn't seem to show much emotion. And then the medical examiner arrived at the house around 10 minutes to 8. It was her opinion that there was no way Christine could have gotten the wounds she had from a fall down the stairs. It seemed to her that Christine had been hit with some kind of blunt object, and the damage to Christine's head looked as if she had been struck from behind. The position of her hands was not right because if she fell forward, she would have dropped the dry cleaning and put out her hands to break her fall. Right. That's what I was saying. I mean, that's a natural reflex when you're falling. Yeah. But Christine's body was on top of the dry cleaning and her hands were near her side. Yeah, so Christine's death was designated as a murder right away. And as a result, search warrants were authorized for the house and the vehicles. After Ken returned from picking up his younger son at the airport, Denson called his cell and asked him to come back to the police station to answer more questions. So you know you're in trouble when they call you back late at night and say we need to talk to we, you more. We need to ask more questions. Yikes, yeah. And I think at that point I would bring an attorney, even if I was innocent. Yeah. Yeah. So Ken arrived at the station at 10 o'clock that evening with both his sons. He hadn't hired an attorney apparently because he still believed that Christine's death was being looked at as an accident. Well, that's very naive. It certainly is. However, Denson had questioned him about the shoes and the paper towel, and Denson also wanted Ken to account for his location prior to going to pick up Carol and Galen. So all of these things really should have tipped him off that he was a suspect. Sure. But, you know, not everyone spends their days reading about crimes day after day. So... I could kind of see where he might not really realize that yet. But Justin noticed right away, and he thought his father was a suspect. He told Ken to hire an attorney. But Ken didn't listen. He went to the station alone anyway. Alone as in no attorney. He went with his kids. You already right. Said. Yeah, but okay. no attorney. The kids aren't going to help him. So this led Denson to believe that Ken thought he could outsmart the police. He was still trying to convince them that his wife's death was an accident. And nobody's believing that. At least nobody professionally. Family right. members and friends are going to believe him for a while. Sure. So the other thing was that Ken could not give the police the name of the person 
who had called him about the real estate property he had visited that day. That, to me, is a huge red flag. Well, yeah. yeah. Plus, you're not exactly sure where the property was when the cops are questioning you? Yeah, a little weird. He said that after arriving at the property, he walked around and he looked at it from different locations. And then according to Ken, he called his house after hearing from the school district that Christine had missed her class. He said there was no answer, so he called her cell. He said also that the answering machine had picked up, but he didn't leave a message. Yeah, Ken also denied any financial issues. He was working as a real estate consultant, and he also did some paralegal work for the lawyer next door. He said that he and Christine were considering selling their home because it was too big for the two of them now that the boys had gone to college. But Ken couldn't give an explanation for why the white sneakers were in the suburban and not in his bedroom closet. He said that he had no recollection of putting them there and that he kept the vehicle locked. So when asked why there might be blood on those shoes, he came up with a possibility. He said that he and Christine work in the garden and she had recently cut herself. This was about one week ago, he said, and he said that the cut was on her right hand. Christine's autopsy was done the next morning, and this is going to shoot down Ken's explanations. But anyway, examination of her head found 20 individual bruises on her face. Most of them were on the left side of her face, which suggested that she had been struck repeatedly by a right-handed person. And there was also white pressure marks on both sides of her neck, indicating that she had been strangled by someone's hands. There was also hemorrhaging in her neck muscles and bruising of her tongue. So if she'd been strangled, there's no way that the stairs did that. No, they didn't. The back of her head had seven lacerations with bruises, and a skull fracture, which was easily felt because it could be moved by the examiner's fingers. Some of the bruising could have happened from a face-first fall down the stairs, but there was no way that all of her injuries were the result of a fall. She had some defensive wounds on her arms, but she had no cut on her right hand. Remember Ken had said that she had cut her hand gardening just a week before her death? Yep. And in the final analysis, Christine's death had been caused by multiple blunt force head injuries and manual strangulation. So Ken's looking more and more guilty. Yes, he is. So Ken is starting to realize that the police felt that he was guilty of murdering his wife. He hired a defense attorney that had been recommended to him by a real estate attorney. This guy's name was Tom Nolan. He was well known in the area, and he was experienced in homicide cases. Yeah, so he wasn't cheap either. I'm sure. But Ken went to speak to the police the next time with his attorney. They sat down with Denson, and Nolan said that it was his understanding that Ken had moved the Suburban while he was wearing the clothing he had been wearing when he performed CPR on Christine. So this meant that it was possible that the blood on his shoes had been transferred from the bloody clothing. And he also suggested that someone else had planted the shoes in the Suburban. So that's a long shot. Well, yeah, but we got to come up for the reason why they're where they are. Yeah, sure. The blood spatter expert observed that there was a lot of blood in the basement, but it was primarily in a pool around her head. There wasn't one drop on the walls, and he didn't believe that Christine had been killed in the basement. A search began to look for any traces of blood throughout the entire house, and during this search, they did find some blood stains in the kitchen. There were blood stains found on the kitchen floor, underneath the kitchen table, and on the legs of the chairs as well next to the table. Yeah, and the spots of blood looked like they might have been diluted, leading to the question of whether someone had tried to clean up in the kitchen. This find changed the way investigators were looking at Christine's murder. If there were blood stains in the kitchen, perhaps she had been attacked there, and then the killer had moved her body to the basement to make it look like she fell. And that sounds reasonable. If the only blood down in the basement was under her head. Yeah. Ken was the only person who would want her murder to look like an accident and who would have had the ability to stage the scene. Well, of course a burglar wouldn't have done this. For one thing, burglars rarely commit murder, and they certainly wouldn't take the time to clean up and stage a scene. So Denson and his team of investigators had a theory about what happened. 
Ken had surprised Christine in the kitchen, attacked her, cleaned up the blood, and then rushed off to pick up Carol and Galen. He was wearing the black leather shoes because he had gotten blood on his sneakers. So, if he had changed those shoes before he went to pick up Carol and Galen, how would one of them have a shoe print in the basement, unless he'd already been down there? Right. So a lot of holes in his story. There was a team of searchers who went through the entire house, noting everything that was found. And they collected hundreds of items, and they had documentation and photos. But the police were trying to put off releasing Christine's manner of death to the public. The case was beginning to get some attention from the media, and even as searchers were in the house, TV reporters and cameras were posted outside. The Palo Alto Daily News learned the results of the autopsy and published a story confirming that Christine's death had been ruled a homicide. So this was big news in the community. Right, because remember, there's like one murder a year. Very rare. So, of course, the neighbors were really unsettled by this. They didn't know if it was a burglar who had killed Christine. They didn't have those kinds of details. And there had been a series of burglaries in the area in the weeks before. So the search team actually went through the Fitzhugh's house on their hands and knees. After several hours, they had identified 70 possible bloodstains. And the next morning, they returned with sterile swabs and distilled water. They rubbed the suspected bloodstains with a damp swab and collected a sample swab for each spot as well as a control swab for each, and eventually they put together a floor plan of the house with red circles marking the blood's locations. Luminol was sprayed over the walls and floors of the house, and one of the kitchen chairs where Christine was believed to be sitting with her coffee and muffin on the table glowed positive. The area of the kitchen floor between the hallway and the table, about four by four feet, glowed with several shoe prints and also large white marks. So out in the hall, the luminol showed more circular spots, which would show someone cleaning, more shoe prints, and even some small paw prints, probably from the Pomeranian. Yeah, maybe the Pomeranian did it. Yeah, those are wicked dogs, right? Very vicious. Yeah. Well, these results painted a picture of what had happened to Christine. She'd been killed in the kitchen, dragged to the basement stairs, and then positioned face down as if she had fallen. At some point, one of their dogs had walked through that blood, and the police were now thoroughly convinced that Ken was the killer. Yeah, and according to forensics experts, once they knew that Christine had been attacked in the kitchen, they knew that Ken was the only person who could have staged her death and cleaned up the house. Well, it's really the only thing that makes sense. Right. The Suburban was processed at the Santa Clara County Crime Lab, and a green short-sleeved Brooks Brothers polo shirt was found under the driver's seat. It had a reddish damp area on the midsection, which was likely blood. Presumptive testing for blood was positive, but there were no other blood stains found in the vehicle. Ken's attorney hired his own pathologist to examine Christine's body. This pathologist noted all the same injuries, but wrote the manner of death as deferred. They are certainly not ready at this point to exclude the possibility of calling a death an accident. Well, yeah, they're not sure what his defense is going to be at that point. Right. But Detective Denson put together what had happened to Christine in his mind. She was hit by a blunt object, possibly a two-by-four, while she was sitting at the kitchen table. Then she was dragged to the landing while he cleaned up. Then he grabbed the dry cleaning and put it at the bottom of the stairs with Christine. He must have put whatever weapon he used into a plastic bag, taken it with him, and disposed of it. As for the blood on his shirt and shoes, he may have been running out of time when he noticed that, so he changed and stuffed the shirt and shoes under the seat of his car. Then he drove off to pick up Carol and Galen, likely tossing the weapon into a dumpster along the way. And this all would have happened between 11 and 1.30. Yeah, but what about a motive? Friends and family members had been interviewed, and no one had anything concerning to say about the couple. There was a $48,000 life insurance policy on Christine, but that didn't seem like enough of a reason for Ken to kill her. And the idea that Ken had killed Christine at all was unbelievable to everyone who knew them. Well, sure, because they see them as kind of this ideal couple. They've been married a long time. Right. After the processing of the house and the suburban, Detectives were working on Ken's alibi, which was also a problem. 
a detective went to San Bruno to talk to the family golf center manager, and this is where Ken had claimed to be when Christine was killed. The manager said that she knew Ken quite well, and he had worked on creating the driving range for them back in 1998 and 1999. But she said that she had not seen Ken in months, definitely not on May 5th. May 5th was the day after the Family Golf Center's New York headquarters had declared bankruptcy. Also, she had a window in her office that looked out onto the undeveloped land. So if Ken had been there walking around for 45 minutes, she would have seen him. Absolutely. A woman who lived on the street behind the Fitzhugh home told detectives that she saw a blue Suburban parked on her street at around 10 a.m. on the day of the murder and that it had been gone when she looked out again at 2 o'clock. So that led to another theory, the theory that Ken had moved his Suburban to the street behind the house that morning and entered the house through the back. Then he must have waited for Christine to come home with the plan to attack her. So this would be evidence of premeditation. Detectives also spoke to his next-door neighbor, the attorney, who he'd been helping with a printer problem between 9 and 11 a.m. He said that he had not arrived until shortly after 10. They'd worked until 11.15 and then Ken had left. He remembered that Ken had not been wearing a green polo shirt and he couldn't remember what shoes Ken had been wearing. And the phone records from the Fitzhugh's two landlines and two cell phones were collected. The answering machine showed that Phyllis Smith of the school district had called the house at 1.15 that day and left a message for Christine. Phyllis confirmed that she had called Ken's office number, which forwarded her to his cell. Ken had answered at 1.16 and told her that he was on the highway, but his cell record showed that his cell phone was in the area of their house when he had taken the call from Phyllis. So it's getting uh, clear that Ken had lied about his alibi. It really is, yeah. So following Christine's funeral, there was actually a change in the way Christine's friends were seeing her murder. Up until then, they had really all insisted that Ken and Christine were in a loving relationship. After the service, however, people began to think more critically. Most of these people knew Ken, but Christine was the friend who they actually knew and spent time with. Ken was shy, and he could be quite condescending. Several people said that Christine had said she was frustrated by Ken's coldness and also his reluctance to share her healthy habits like exercising and eating better. So the couple seemed more platonic than romantic when they were together. Several people said that Ken would also check up on Christine like he was jealous, sometimes showing up unannounced at a dinner or other social event she was attending. The DNA evidence came back, showing that it was Christine's blood on Ken's shoes and shirt, So with this information, detectives were able to get an arrest warrant for Ken. The Palo Alto police had been watching Ken, and they pulled him over on the freeway with the California Highway Patrol helping to block off traffic. And this was on the day of Justin's graduation, so Justin had neither parent there for him. Just pretty sad. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, because Christine was just so excited about his graduation. Well, sure. Justin had actually had some difficulty in high school, and he was just doing so well. She was so proud of him. Now, Ken was arrested quietly, and he had nothing to say to the arresting officers. The news reports paraphrased Denson, saying that the luminol test done in the Fitzhugh kitchen had shown a bloodbath. Yeah, so Ken pleaded not guilty. He was held in jail with bail set at $10 million. Whoa. Yes, it was just as good as not having any bail, I guess. I guess he's not going anyplace. And the detectives, though, were still looking for the motive. That was an issue. You don't have to have a motive, but it certainly helps. The violence of the murder led them to believe that it was either jealousy or money. And when they spoke to longtime friends in San Diego that had hung out with the couple, they learned that Christine had had a long-term sexual relationship with Robert Brown, and that Justin was believed to be Brown's biological child. So that's the first they heard of that. Yeah, so when Detective Denson contacted Brown, he said he hadn't seen the Fitzhughes in four years. He professed shock on hearing that Ken had been arrested for Christine's murder. Brown was unsure if Ken knew about his affair with Christine. I just keep coming back to thinking, how did he not know? And how did Brown not know that Ken knew? 
There's right. something funky there. Not quite right. And I don't know if it's just that Brown's brain was, you know, messed up from drugs and alcohol, or if he really didn't think Ken knew. That seems so naive to me. Yeah, I know. I'm sticking with my original thoughts that it was known. Yeah, maybe. Well, in his conversations with detectives, Brown portrayed Ken as a calculating and controlling man. He didn't think Christine had told Ken about Justin's paternity, and he thought maybe money was a motive. Denson learned that the $48,000 life insurance policy had a double indemnity clause, meaning that Ken would collect $96,000. Now, to people who knew them, the Fitzhughes were considered wealthy, but it seems that their financial situation really had changed for the worse. Yeah, the week following Christine's murder, Ken had gone to a bank to borrow money on the house, and also some checks had bounced just before the murder and there is a tax lien filed against them. This is something that's, that's not just all of a sudden happening. This, these people have been in financial difficulties for a while. Well, they'd have to because they certainly had a cushion. Yep. So then there was the issue of the antiques. Brown had told them that the Fitzhughes had about one and a half million dollars worth of antiques in their house. But there was nothing like that there at the time of Christine's death. Brown estimated the value of the contents of their home at two million. But Ken had estimated the value at only 125000 That's a big discrepancy. Very big. So they did do paternity testing to prove that Robert Brown was Justin's biological father. And Ken would claim to be in disbelief. He claimed not to have suspected that Brown was the father at all. Then in January 2001, Ken read a news article about a collision between a submarine and a fishing boat near Hawaii. And he read that the survivors had trouble remembering the event. So this gave him an idea. He brought this up as a possible explanation for why he couldn't remember putting his shoes into the Suburban. And he asked his attorney, Nolan, if he could be hypnotized to remember. So his attorney contacted a Stanford psychiatrist. And in April, he went to the jail and he attempted to hypnotize Ken. But it just seemed like a fake, because in the first few minutes, he recalled that after he washed his hands in the bathroom, he went outside to check on the dogs, and he finally remembered picking up the white sneakers off of the front porch and putting them under the car seat. So that's super convenient for him. Uh Uh-huh. And as for the green shirt, Ken remembered that he had picked up the shirt from a pile of rags on the floor and used it to wipe his hands. Then when he went out to the car, he left it there. But to me, that doesn't explain why he would have shoved it under the car seat. No. So Ken's trial began July 2nd, 2001. Prosecution argued that Ken killed his wife to bury the secret of Justin's paternity. Brown testified that he never told Ken about the affair. In 1999, he sent a postcard to the Fitzhugh home saying that he had moved. He included his new telephone number and a note saying that he was clean. Shortly after that, Christine called him and told him about Justin's upcoming graduation. So Ken was convicted of second-degree murder. They weren't able to prove premeditation, and he was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. The murder weapon had not been found, and many of Christine's facial injuries could have been caused by Ken's fists in the heat of an argument. But the motive for the murder remains uncertain. Ken may have been angry that Christine was about to reveal to Justin that his biological father was Robert Brown. I think that's a good possibility. Or it may have been about money. It certainly could have been. I mean, if they did at one time have one or two million Mm dollars in antiques in their house, it seems like he might have been selling things off or liquidating them for money. It certainly does. And I think about the bell. He said he was thinking of selling it on eBay. Why would you do that if you're well off? Why are you going to worry about selling an old bell? So it does seem like he was selling things off. And it seems like some of this might have come as a surprise to Christine because he's the one with the, you know, unsteady income and kind of in the risky business, if you will. So he could have been the one losing a lot of money and she could have been really upset about that. Maybe she was going to leave him because she wasn't the type of woman who was going to tell people about her personal life like that. Remember, she was kind of obsessed with how she looked to other people. So she probably would keep most of that a secret. And if she was going to leave him, he really could have lost it and attacked her over that. 
Sure. I'm almost leaning more towards the money than the paternity thing, because like you said, how could he not know? Yeah, I'm going to discount that. And even the kid. Wouldn't the kid be suspicious? Yeah. I think so. Now, after his conviction, Ken continued to maintain his innocence. The case even went to the California Supreme Court. But he did receive compassionate release parole from San Quentin in February 2012 because of a terminal illness. And months later, he was dead. That's kind of a flat ending to this story, isn't it? Well, it is. I don't know about being set free. I guess if he was only set free for a few months at the end of his life, you can't complain too much. But Christine didn't have that, you know. She was just brutally murdered when she was still pretty much in the prime of her life. So I'm not a big fan of Ken. Not a likable guy. And I certainly think he was guilty. I don't think there's much doubt of that, even though I feel like the police jumped to conclusions pretty quickly. Yeah, I think they did, but I don't see anyone else who could have done it. No, and I have to tell you, it kind of makes me reconsider the Michael Peterson case. Because, you know, I've leaned towards he didn't do it, but maybe it's getting older or learning about more cases. I'm starting to think that he probably did murder her and it wasn't an owl. It probably wasn't. (laughs) That'll make a lot of our listeners happy because that opinion is not popular. The owl opinion. The owl theory. Yeah. Yeah. So our sources for this case are the Palo Alto Online Archives and a book titled Blood Will Tell by Carlton Smith. A lot of detail, though. So if you're interested in the case, it's worth a read. Okay. Let's move on. We got some feedback? Yeah, we do. What have we got for a voicemail? I got two voicemails for you today. Nice. And one email. So... First one's from Linda and her husband, Dave, from Colorado. They have a beer review for us and a case suggestion. All right, let's hear it. Hi, Dick and Jill. This is Linda and Dave Scott from Colorado Springs. Hey! (laughs) So that was Dave, and this is Linda. So we have kind of like a little beer review for you. It's not... as exact as Dick would like, I'm sure. But this is a beer from New Belgium Brewing in Fort Collins, Colorado. It's an IPA and it's called Voodoo Ranger. It's very, very hoppy. It's got a golden and fruity little taste. So it's kind of like... A golden beer with a vanilla head. I would call it a golden IPA. It's pretty bitter, and it's got about a 7% alcohol content to it. Um, This is kind of our summer beer that we go to. Uh, We like to stay close to home and enjoy the beers from our local breweries. So I know, Dick, this isn't... A really great recommendation, but at least I hope that you will understand it. So we also have a case that we would like to bring to your attention. It's very new and it hasn't been solved, but it started in May of 2020 when a gal named Suzanne Morphew went for allegedly a bicycle ride On Mother's Day, she's from the Maysville area in Chaffee County, Colorado. Her brother has decided to open an investigation on his own because nothing has been done with this and nobody can find any clues, but the police haven't officially named her husband as a suspect, although that's kind of where it's going. And I guess that's all I've got for you right now. Chafee County is up by Monarch Pass, which is a ski resort here in Colorado, just to the southwest of Colorado Springs. Oh, I forgot to tell you, she got cut off because she hit the three minute mark. Okay. And boom. I think it was only 10 more seconds. Okay. Well, thanks, Dave and Linda. Especially Linda, because she did most of the talking. Yeah, we just had a brief shout-out from Dave. 
Yeah, so this isn't the Dave that we met in Colorado last year from Colorado Springs. I'm, if it is, he didn't identify himself as that way. Okay. I just remember we didn't meet his wife, but he said his wife was a true crime person. But I'm sure he would have let us know if she'd left a voicemail. I think so. Yeah. Because we still correspond with each other. Sure. Now but I, they live in Colorado Springs. And they, they have dogs. A dog. Now I heard more than one, I think. Well, could be neighborhood dogs, too. Yeah. Yeah, they have Rocket the Wonder Dog. Oh, nice. If that's the same people, which we're making too many suppositions. I don't think it's the same people. No, me either. <laughs> okay. So anyway. Sorry about that. Voodoo Ranger, I think Linda belittles herself a bit because that was a nice review. I liked it. And that's a nice beer. We like Colorado, so we've been there a few times. And yeah, we've had a good uh, beer we've had. Had a few new Belgian beers. I've had Voodoo Ranger. I've had the Imperial Voodoo Ranger, which is a little bit more alcohol. And just recently, I had a pumpkin beer called Voodoo Ranger Atomic Pumpkin. Ooh, was that good? It was okay. It's a spicy pumpkin. Yeah. So, And it's got like three different kinds of chilies in it, so you really have to like some heat. Okay. So that's good. And the, the case suggestion, we're definitely going to do this because this is, this is going to be a big case. It's still in its infancy. Well, what's going on in Colorado, man? There's the last couple of years, wives are just disappearing. And they are. So this Suzanne Morphew, as Linda said, was allegedly out for a bike ride on Mother's Day when she didn't return home. Her body has not been found. Her bicycle's been found. Her brother is wanting to pursue the case. The police are being fairly closed-mouthed about it and giving information about it. Well, that's usually appropriate, though. That's a good idea. Yeah. So, but I think there's going to be a lot of stuff coming out. The husband, obviously, is a suspect or a person of interest because he's a husband. Yeah, now these are middle-aged people with yeah, older kids? Yeah, they have kids? Uh, two daughters that are in high school and college, and I think she was around 49 or 50 years old. Yeah, that does sound fascinating. Yeah, we're going to keep a watch on it. Okay, thanks, Linda, and thanks, Dave. Okay, then there's a quickie note from Penelope. She has a case suggestion, which we'll tell her we've already done. <laughs> okay. Hey there, Dick and Jill. I have a suggestion for a case. I haven't seen this on your roster. So it is the murder of a woman named Anne Marie Fahey. And I believe that's F-A-H-E-Y, I think, or A-Y. It's an Irish name. This happened in Delaware some years ago. A very prominent Delaware attorney named Thomas Capano was eventually convicted of the murder. So um, just wondering, you know, if you have ever heard of this case or if you might look into it. It's a bit personal for me because I was in Delaware in a Catholic Girls Academy at the same time when Thomas Capana was in a boys academy. And I think we were at the same dances and the same <laughs> social events and so on. I don't think I ever met him. Thank heavens. Um, <laughs> thank heavens I never met him. But um, anyway, just a suggestion. And uh, I hope you guys are doing okay. Take care. Thanks, Penelope. Yeah, that was a good case. I put it in here because we have actually done this case. Yeah, but uh, it's a really fascinating one that's left an impression on me. Absolutely fascinating. Great book about it. The episode was aired on July 29th, 2019. And I would just remind people, or maybe they don't know, if you're trying to find out if we've done some other episodes, just hit the magnifying glass on the website. And yeah, you can search you any can, name and it should pop up. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the title of the episode. You can put in Anne-Marie Fay. Yeah. What was the name of it? I forget. Okay. I know. I but should. you're telling people they could look it up and you haven't. <laughs> okay. But, but all I did was just, I knew we had done it within the, the last year or so. So I just looked back from mid-2019 on and found it in July. And I didn't bother looking at the title. <laughs> well, yeah, this was a fascinating case because it was a young woman having an affair with this kind of important guy, lack for a better word. Right. And it took a long time to get enough evidence to be able to charge him and convict him. Good story. Okay, so, it was titled Out to Sea, The Life and Death of Anne-Marie Fahey. There you go. Uh, we have an email from your friend Cindy. Okay. And, and Cindy says, look at the Susan and Tony Alamo Ministries cult murders. 
Ooh. Cindy's reading a book about the cult titled Whispering in the Daylight, and it sounds interesting. These two people founded the Alamo Christian Foundation in 1969, and this foundation has had numerous problems with the law. Uh, and Tony, in 2009, was convicted of 10 charges of child rape. Ooh. Yeah, he's slime. So he was in prison, and then in 2017, he died in prison. We might want to check into this some more. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. The cults are always fascinating, right? Oh, we love those. Well, I don't know if we love them. Well, okay. <laughs> Maybe not love. Yeah, but they do make for fascinating cases, absolutely. So thanks, Cindy. Cindy always sends great suggestions, and we definitely appreciate what Cindy does, her loyalty. She's been listening to us from the beginning, I believe. She has been. It's and incredible. she's had so many suggestions. I, we could almost do the whole year on Cindy's suggestions. Or how about a coffee table book titled Cindy's Case Suggestions? Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's a lot. There are a lot. I appreciate it very so, much. Thank you, Cindy. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, let's wrap things up. I'd like to give a thank you to everyone for listening and everyone for sending us their case suggestions and feedback. We really appreciate it. Yeah, there's been an uptick on the voice messages, so that's great. We do love that. So if you have any case suggestions, we would love it if you sent us a voicemail about it. It's much nicer to hear the voices than to read them. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we will see you next time at next the time. quiet end. Plenty of seats. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.